Hello everybody, good evening for the Europeans, good afternoon to the North Americans and Canadians. Welcome to this third webinar of Institut de la Main. I would like to thank all your speakers, Dominique, Pierre, Graham and Joaquin for being with us uh, tonight. Uh, today we are going to discuss a difficult topic, which is stiffness of uh, elbow arthroplasty. Four presentations will be given concerning the etiology of stiffness and more particularly the therapeutic option can, that can be proposed when stiffness occurs. Dominique will be in charge on, of the chat with me. Please don't hesitate to ask questions either in French or in English. You have uh, also a dedicated space on the right of your screen if you leave uh, personal messages. After each of the first two communications, we will have also be asked through two polls to share your experience with this difficult problem. Then we will have two presentations for therapeutic options. Discussion will be at the end of all the communication and we have planned 15 minutes for that. I wish you a very good webinar and I give the floor to Dominique to introduce the first communication. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here tonight with all of you. Um, the first presentation is Dr. Anne Vidzel uh, from Institut de la Main uh, in Paris. Uh, I know her for a long time. We're sharing a presentation sometime on the elbow and it's always a great occasion to learn a lot of things. So I'm sure it's going to be very interesting. The title is Radial Head Prosthesis, Easy to Do, Also Easy to Fail. Have a good presentation. So, uh, thank you, Dominique. As you said, radial head prosthesis is so easy to do and so easy to fail. The most common indication for radial head prosthesis are non-reconstructable radial head fracture because it has many advantages, simpler and faster therapeutic solution for this complex fracture, immediate stability for the elbow joint, no healing problem in terms of bone consolidation, therapeutic option in case of ORI failure, and better than radial head resection when ORI is impossible. But we know that radial prosthesis have also some disadvantages. Few implants allow to recreate precise anatomy. Perfect implantation is necessary to restore the exact length of the radius for good stability and good mobility. With follow-up, we observe capitulum erosion and secondary degenerative lesions. Long-term complications include, like any other arthroplasty, loosening, wear, osteolysis, and implant failure. So how to implant radial prosthesis? It seems to be easy. Through a lateral approach, you resect the radial head, you broach the radius, you try, and you implant the components. However, some rules must be respected. The goal is to obtain a stable and mobile elbow to allow early rehabilitation. Each implant has its specific surgical technique. Restoring the anatomy causes difficulties in determining the size and the height of the prosthesis. Which size to choose? Between two sizes, it's better to undecide the implants to prevent Overstuffing, there are indicative height marks. Fund Riot uses the benchmark between the coronary process and the radial notch. 
or francs, the height of the joint space in the humeral you know, compartment must be symmetrical. So distal radial ulnar index and complete uh, passive mobility inflection at the end of procedure can be also used. In acute traumatic injuries, implantation of the prosthesis should take into account any associated ligament lesions. LCL lesion is suspected with radial instability in valgus extension supination and required a systematic ligament repair either by direct reinsertion or by ligamentoplasty. Radiological instability of the distal radiolinar joint makes a sex injury treated by fixed loose prosthesis associated with radiolinar pinning or ligamentoplasty. There is no consensus for the treatment of MCL lesions. It seems to be indicated in the case of residual instability after appropriate treatment of lateral lesions. Over the last decades, the many different types of radial prosthesis have been developed with various combinations of their properties. It may vary in terms of fixation technique, material, polarity, and modularity. The choice will be made according to local anatomic conditions and the surgeon preference. Primary radial prosthesis shows good or excellent outcomes in about 85% of patients. However, complications are not uncommon and has been described in up to 23%. A systematic, systematic review made for Shenzhen in 2018 showed that on average, 8% of radial head prosthesis has been revised early within four years follow of follow-up. The reason for revision were in majority Systematic loosening in 30%, stiffness in 20%, and pain in 17%. The other etiology were less frequent, overstuffing, dissociation of the prosthesis, and some automatic osteoarthritis. What to do when the situations become complicated with prosthetic instability or secondary joint stiffness? Stiffness can be present either with or without osteoarthritis and or implant failure. It has been documented to find the etiology. There is a variety of implant-specific failure possible, loosening, instability, malignment, dissociation, breakage of the prosthesis, or overstuffing. Overstuffing can mean either oversizing, when the head of the prosthesis is too big, or over lengthening when the head of the prosthesis is placed too high in relation to the ulna. Treatment includes treatment of the audiology and joint release, more often by open procedure with the same approach to revise arthroplasty. When stiffness is isolated, that means any osteoarthritis and goose prosthesis, the surgical treatment includes capsular release removal of heterotopic ossification, sometimes associated with release of the posterior bundle of the AMCL, like any other arthrolysis. Loosening can be treated with revision to cemented prosthesis or by press fitting a larger and cemented stain. For other etiologies, complete or partial revision of the prosthesis is required. With modular prosthesis, it's possible to modify the diameter of the radial cup or the height of the prosthesis. Changing implants can lead to a number of technical difficulties. For non cemented implants, it's often difficult, sometimes impossible, to extract them. For cemented implants, removing the cement can be technically demanding due to the small diameter of the radius and the length of the cement sheath. Moreover, there is significant neurologic risk due to the anatomical contiguity with the posterior and teresus nerve. Prosthetic resection is possible if there are no lateral or longitudinal instability. It can be used in case of overstuffing. An oculus arthroplasty is recommended during the procedure to avoid any ascent of the radius. Oculus arthroplasty was described by Moray in 2002. Through a lateral approach, onconeus muscle is detached from distal to proximal, inserting into the joint under the lateral ulnar collateral ligament 
and interpose between the proximal radius and capitellum. Complications are not common after radial head prosthesis and adequate management can be challenging. A rigorous technique for an appropriate implantation leads to better results than in secondary. Some rules may be respected in determining size and height of the prosthesis to avoid stiffness or instability. Before implanting radial head prosthesis, a society lesion has to be detected to treat them during arthroplasty procedure. There are several types of implant on the market, but one surgical technique for one implant that can we know. Thank you. Thank you. We don't have any questions from um, uh, the participants, um, but I would like to know, um, in case of a stiffness after radial head arthroplasty, where the size is perfect according to your eyes and your x-ray, uh, do you sometimes release the annular ligament if the problem is prosupination? Um, is it something you can do or and can you do that arthroscopically or you would prefer to do open? Your, your question is if I have to revise uh, a radial head prosthesis. Okay. Um, when I check the, the diameter of the, of the radial head, I try to, to put a, a smaller one. And uh, sometimes you feel additional tissue all around the, the radial head. And uh, this tissue can limit the pronosupination. But if I have nothing, uh, I try to release the annular ligament because uh, sometimes it uh, causes to, um, uh, for stiffness. Um, but you know, um, if uh, you have a real problem with the prosthesis, you have to revise the prosthesis. But if your prosthesis is good, and if you have any secondary uh, degenerative lesion, is like uh, a simple, if I can say simple, arthralysis of the elbow. Yes, Graham, you have a question? Yeah, I just... Uh... I uh, wanted to bring up the point of the wrist, though. I mean, sometimes when you release around the radial head, particularly if they're stuck in pronation or, or supination, sometimes, you know, people rehab the elbow, they're keeping the arm in pronation for a lateral ligament insufficient elbow, and the arm will get stuck in pronation. And sometimes if there's been a wrist injury, that the uh, volar capsule of the wrist will limit you uh, of the distorted ulnar joint will limit you from supination. So I, I just want to remind people, don't forget about the wrist, because if you've done everything at the elbow and it still won't supinate, think about doing a volar capsule release of the distal radial ulnar joint, particularly if it's a longer standing contracture. Uh, it's sometimes quite helpful. We have two questions here. One from uh, Dr. Yassine Carlier. Uh, the question is, do you think that the radial head prosthesis is only a spacer allowing for the healing of the ligament? Hmm. I'm not sure about that because, uh, you know, uh, you have to, you need to have a stable lateral column, but uh, I think uh, radial head prosthesis have uh, its own uh, wall uh, for her elbow mobility. So, that's why um, Swanson implant doesn't work very well. You have problem with uh, the material, but uh, uh, Swanson uh, uh, prosthesis was uh, very, um, uh, um, it's, it's not a real prosthesis. So I think you have to choose the, the prosthesis you want to use uh, uh, in terms of uh, the etiology and the, 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 the treatment you want to have for the elbow. So it's not only uh, a, uh, something for the space for uh, ligament healing. So I will just ask a last question. It's like uh, participants are getting away. Um, can you say something about your rehabilitation protocol after a radial head arthroplasty? And after we'll go to the next uh, session. Okay. Um, first, uh, I don't want to put any sling after surgery. I try to do my best to, to have no use and no need for a sling. And uh, I, I become a very early the rehabilitation. If uh, it's a revised for stiffness, uh, during the procedure, I, I do orthesis in maximum extension and maximum inflection. 
it's very important for the patient to see the mobility you have during uh, in the OT, and uh, it's helpful uh, to to have some uh, postural uh, movements uh, of the elbow and to maintain the mobility you obtain during the procedure. Okay, if there's uh, no any uh, question, we will move uh, to the polls. Uh, in your experience, the most common symptom after radial arthroplasty is pain, stiffness, instability, or infection. Let's vote now. Number one, the uh, result is 58% for stiffness, 40% yes. for pain, and 2% for uh, instability. And nobody saw any infection of his life, so 0%. Okay, so let's move to the second poll. In your experience, the most prevalent reason for revision of failure of radial arthroplasty are, oops, sorry, oversizing or over lengthening, dissociation of the prosthesis, instability of the prosthesis, symptomatic osteoarthritis, or symptomatic loosening. Let's vote to so share your experience, please. Um, are not surprising for me. So the number one reason for revision is oversize. The second one is loosening. Third one is osteoarthritis. Instability, 6%. And dissociation of prosthesis, zero. Okay. It's interesting. So the, the, the prevent treatment for stiffness is to do uh, the, the good uh, prosthesis in the, uh, in the first uh, surgery. So perhaps we move to the second communication. Uh, I let you introduce uh, Graham. Mm -hmm. Of course. So it's an honor again for me to present uh, Professor Graham King, who let me a little bit spy in his uh, elbow room when I was a fellow a long time ago already. He's professor at Western University and working at Hennen Operating Clinic. He's going to present a talk about stiffness after uh, total elbow arthroplasty the reason. Good presentation. Well, thank you, Dominique, and good evening, everyone. Uh, we're going to start off, actually, this talk with a, with a poll. So do we have the polls ready to roll? Yes, yes. It's, uh, uh, I, I can read it for you, uh, Graham. So the first question is uh, the causes of postoperative uh, total laboratory uh, stiffness. Uh, all except the following is a tropic ossification, suboptimal component positioning, delay in motion until two weeks post op, or preoperative stiffness. So this is all except the following. Yes, all except the following. Uh, okay, final answer. So number one is the delaying motion until two weeks post op, 56%. Preoperative stiffness, 28. Suboptimal component positioning, 10%. And the last one, heterotopic ossification, 5%. Okay. Let's move to the uh, second questions. Uh, Postoperative uh, uh, total laboratory stiffness can be reduced by preoperative physiotherapy using an unlinked uh, arthroplasty using a tricep detaching surgical approach or answering a functional range, range of motion intraoperatively. Let's vote. Thank you. So uh, the first thing is uh, to reduce the stiffness, ensuring a functional range of motion intraoperatively, 84%. Wow. Preoperative physio, 8%. Using a tricep detaching surgical approach, 6 and using an unlinked arthroplasty, 2%. Okay, Graham, we are hearing to you. Well, I don't really need to give this talk because most people got the answers right, so I feel like uh, I've done my job just asking the polls. But anyway, we'll, we'll go through this uh, topic, which is uncommon as a topic. I mean, we all see stiffness after total elbow arthroplasty, but actually we often don't do anything about it. But let's just get to the reasons that I see my patients getting stiffness after a total elbow. I do have disclosures which are directly relevant to this particular topic, but I'll try to minimize those. So this is someone that's likely to be stiff after surgery. This is a lady that was referred to me actually from Montreal where Dominic lives. She has bilateral fused elbows. And for, unfortunately at that time, Dominic hadn't come to visit us yet. So I, I ended up treating her 
she hasn't moved her elbows for many, many years. And even if you put in an arthroplasty like we did, you're not going to get a great range of motion. Now, we did uh, provide her substantial improvement in function in that she was actually able to feed herself and improve transfers when we did both sides. Uh, but again, if you're starting off with a very, very stiff elbow, it's very important to set the goals clearly for patients so that they know if they're really stiff, no matter what you do, they're not going to have a normal range of motion, particularly when it's a range of motion that's been absent for many, many years. Here's another example here of a 78-year-old uh, lady, a combination of inflammatory arthritis and osteoarthritis. And you can see the large osteophytes here, the narrowing of the joint space. And again, she's only got 30-degree arc of motion. Uh, even if you do a great job here uh, and put the implant in correctly, uh, you're still going to have stiffness. And, and this is what her range of motion was. Now, she was pretty delighted about this, but I was a bit disappointed because I thought I'd get a little bit more range of motion. So the most important reason for stiffness after an elbow arthroplasty is you're stiff to start with. So you're already coming out of the gates with a problem. I think when you have to delay range of motion more than a couple of weeks, then you start getting into difficulty. Obviously, these are all difficulties here. We don't tend to see as much flap failure now as our patients aren't on as much steroids in the, as in the old days. Uh, and I've also found less problems with flaps when I've actually delayed motion until two weeks as opposed to moving people in a week or two or in the first few days like I was actually taught when I was uh, in my training. So I think uh, if you have to delay motion for a long time to deal with a wound, you're more likely to get stiff. And of course, here's various uh, uh, treatments such as a radial forearm flap to manage that. So I think if you know the, the, the wound is going to need something done, don't just look at it, get on, get the flap done and try to get the patient's elbow moving so they can restore motion. The other thing which is kind of interesting and I didn't really realize when I started my practice, but probably your surgical approach matters if, uh, and whether you keep the triceps on or off does matter with respect to stiffness, particularly with restore, restoration of elbow extension, as well as flexion to some extent, because when you think about how you rehab someone where you've taken off the triceps, you don't want them flexing too far right away or you may tear the repair. And here's some data from the paper by DAC showing the difference of range of motion achieved between leaving the triceps off and leaving the triceps on. On is in red, and you can see better range of motion was achieved in their group when they left the triceps on than when they detached it. And I think for me, it's also made a difference because early range of motion now with the triceps on approach really allows the patient to to actively flex and extend right away after after you start range of motion, and that's been a uh, improved my results uh, following surgery as well. I think a technical aspect, of just like radial head prostheses we learned, is if you actually place the components too proud, particularly on the humerus where it's easier to see, but I think it also happens on the ulna. This is a, one of my own patients, long-standing RA. Uh, we did this uh, unlinked arthroplasty uh, 10 years ago, and if you look carefully, the implant on the far left, uh, the axis of motion through the axis bolt here is in green, but the actual axis of motion of the humerus is at the anterior inferior aspect of the medial epicondyle. So this humeral component is too proud, and that did interfere with her ability to restore elbow extension. So again, during surgery, make sure that you have the component in the correct position. And if you're struggling getting elbow extension, always remember to check, is my ulnar component deep enough? And is my humeral component deep enough? Because that is a technical factor which you can change during surgery to improve your range of motion. I think another thing we don't think so much about is impingement with the implant, uh, particularly when you have a pre-existing deformity here, as you can see in this lady with a, a prior Montasia injury. Uh, the, the coronoid is quite prominent in this particular patient, and if you put in a humeral component with an anterior flange, it's possible that the humeral uh, component flange will hit the coronoid in flexion. I know this is a, an obvious example, and this was our, uh, uh, described by Emily Chung and Sean O'Driscoll in 2007. So it's nothing new, but it's something you should always check during surgery. Do I have 
with the flexion I need during surgery, and this was in one of the poll questions, you want to make sure that the coronoid's not impinging with the, with the anterior flange of the humeral component. Similarly, in extension, make sure that the olecranon's not interfering or impinging posteriorly. So again, that's something you can change as a surgeon. Always check for that interoperably. I think we always check for the olecranon, but it's easy to miss the coronoid because it's harder to see that. It's just something you need to check and look for impingement because if you get that impingement as Emily Chung shows, it can also cause distraction of the ulnar component and perhaps earlier loosening. So again, something to be avoided. Heterotopic bone. This can happen after a total elbow arthroplasty. This is a patient I treated, uh, post-traumatic uh, elbow arthritis. I know they say you can take out the radial head in Europe, uh, doctor, uh, in Spain, I should say, and you don't get uh, trouble, but certainly in my country, we seem to have trouble after we take out the radial head, and this is a patient who's 53, uh, uh, and it's got uh, osteoarthritis after, not rheumatoid, osteoarthritis after radial head excision. And here it is, a post-op seven years, and you can see the significant heterotopic bone which occurred after excising, uh, excuse me, after doing a total elbow arthroplasty. This was surprising to me. It's just osteoarthritis, post-traumatic osteoarthritis, many years after a radial head excision, but it can come and bite you. And, and just like uh, any operation around the elbow, heterotopic ossification can occur and, and can be quite problematic. I would say more commonly, it tends to happen in patients with distal humeral fractures acutely. And I actually, we reported that recently in our paper. We do see heterotopic bone after total elbow arthroplasty for fracture. Uh, here, it didn't really impinge uh, too much on reflection, but uh, uh, certainly something that you should be warning patients about when you're doing a total elbow for fracture. So in summary, when you think about uh, the causes of stiffness of a total elbow arthroplasty, Think about elbows that are stiff to start with, where you've had to delay motion due to wound problems. Uh, think about trying to keep the triceps on to reduce the stiffness. Make sure you get your component placement correct and make sure you don't have any impingement of the coronoid, olecranon, and even occasionally the radial head uh, uh, after you put in your prosthesis. And finally, warn patients so they're not surprised if they get heterotopic ossification after an elbow arthroplasty. Thank you very much. Thank you, Graham, for this great uh, communication. Um, I really agree uh, with you about uh, the technique and the triceps uh, uh, approach uh, for total elbow arthroplasty. You know, um, when I, before uh, I use uh, disinsertion of the triceps and I very often have a loss of mobility in the extension, and uh, loss, this loss of mobility uh, because of uh, muscular insufficiency uh, uh, becomes uh, a stiffness of the uh, arthroplasty. So now I change my approach and I have a less uh, uh, loss of intention uh, after total arthroplasty. Um, Dominique, uh, is there any question uh, on the chat for Graham? Not uh, that I see. Uh, I made a comment on the PUDA with the cause of loss of flexion, but, uh, but uh, for a question I have personally, uh, in the etiology of stiffness, uh, I had a few patients who had the uh, ulnar nerve uh, kind of neuropathy post total elbow. And when this was treated, as well as arthrolysis, um, they get uh, much better, especially the flexion can be decreased. So I don't know if you have some, maybe you, you're better than me with nerves. Uh, at first, so you don't have this complication, but uh, can you comment? Yeah, I think uh, I do a routinely a transposition of my elbow, uh, of the ulnar nerve in a total elbow. So I think that the kind of just like the delayed onset ulnar neuropathy, like Sean Driscoll and, and Joaquin have reported uh, from arthrolysis, uh, it doesn't seem to be a big problem in my practice because we're not getting the nerve stretched in, 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 as they're coming into flexion. But there's no question ulnar neuropathy is a problem with total of arthroplasty. And uh, uh, I'm not, uh, and I think people can get uh, CRPS or complex regional pain syndromes when they get their ulnar nerve problem. Uh, I think if you haven't 
or if you haven't transposed a nerve or someone hasn't transposed a nerve and they're having trouble gaining flexion, I fully agree with you that an early intervention, arthrolysis with or without transposition is quite important to, to gain flexion. So it's something I probably should think about. I didn't put it in the talk, but thanks, thanks for mentioning that. Very good point. We have a question, sorry, from the, the chat, from Dr. Sawala. Um, do you think Amy for fracture get more stiffness than total elbow arthroplasty? I think it's a good question. Yeah, we haven't, uh, we haven't uh, studied that in our group. It's certainly my impression that they do. Uh, I know they've, they're doing the trial uh, up in uh, Scandinavia with an RCT of HEMI versus total for fracture. I think, the, I think it, the difference is doing a HEMI is like an unlinked arthroplasty. Uh, and after the surgery, you've got to fix the epicondyles. Uh, you're tethering the flexor pronator origins while you're fixing the epicondyles. And you're a little maybe more careful after the rehab. Whereas if you do a linked arthroplasty and you let them move right away, uh, I think that uh, they probably do have less stiffness. So yes, but I don't consider them equivalent procedures because for me, I don't do hemis in, in old, low-demand patients. I do a total elbow, but I use it really in the younger, higher-demand patient where I don't want to do a total elbow for a distal humeral fracture. But, you know, I guess we'll, we'll learn about that when, the, when our Scandinavian colleagues uh, uh, report their study. Okay, if there's uh, any other question, we will move to the next communication uh, with Pierre, um, uh, who proposes a therapeutic solution when uh, stiffness occurs after uh, total elbow atroplasty. So, Pierre, we are listening to you. Thank you, Anne. Thank you to invite me for this uh, web winner with uh, my friend. So, I'm going to talk about uh, stiffness after total elbow atroplasty. And maybe uh, to give some uh, uh, solution. Uh, so we have heard uh, with uh, Graham talks a different uh, type of etiology of the stiffness after 12 arthroplasty that could be preoperative, preoperative or postoperative, related to the implant or not related to the implant. It's important to know that uh, stiffness after Total albatroplasty has not been considered as a complication in the literature, but rather uh, give fair or poor results. And this clinical limitation can be accepted by the patient, especially if pain has been avoided. So uh, before uh, proposing um, uh, treatment for uh, stiffness, you have to discuss with the patient of this uh, um, limitation. So instead of um, talking about managing stiffness after total arthroplasty, I think the more important is to prevent stiffness during the procedure by dealing with the skin, the previous incision, preserving the triceps, as you just said, identify the joint line specifically for a very stiff elbow or fused elbow, release the capsule and ligament, positioning uh, adequately the component without impingement and with an adapt post-operative post uh, protocol. The skin incision uh, is the starting of, the, of your surgery and is very seriously considered because prior, prior surgery is common and if possible must be ideally incorporate uh, any prior incision in your, um, in your, uh, post in your uh, surgical incision. Then what about the tricep? We heard that we have to preserve as possible the tricep, but in some cases, uh, the tricep is not preserved at the expense of adequate exposure, especially very um, uh, deformed, uh, very distorted elbow or uh, fused elbow. In these cases, the triceps has to be elevated from the medial and lateral aspect of the humerus and mobilize to eliminate a contribution to subsequent motion loss. Lateral soft tissue stripping occur entirely by entering the cocker uh, interval and elevating the extensor mass from the anterior lateral joint. And medially also the flexor pronator mass is elevated to expose the anterior medial aspect of the very distorted or fused joint. I choose to, to speak about this uh, very difficult cases. Like in these cases, when there is no joint line visible, uh, this is a post-traumatic sequela, 
uh, it was a re really fuse elbow. The first uh, start is to uh, get the joint line. So you have to do a, a bone cut a transact to, to transact the humerus, separating the hum to separate the humerus from the ulna in a nerve in a manner to preserve the triceps if if possible and uh, the brachialis attachment. Then the anterior bone is resected to avoid impingement with flexion. And if present, the so radial head is used as a landmark laterally, and it can be resected afterward. And the prominence of the coronoid process is a major landmark. Then, as I just said, you will need an aggressive uh, release of the anterior capsule, as well as a flexor and pronator muscle mass is essential uh, in order to uh, both balance the elbow and to gain as much motion as possible during surgery. The collateral ligament insertion uh, are released also from the humerus insertion uh, on the lateral and on the medial side. So using then an implant with an anterior flange allow to find the axis of rotation by positioning the anterior flange up to the roof of the olecranon fossa. So this is a good landmark. However, in a very stiff elbow, positioning of the humerus component more proximally allowed to get some kind of relaxation of the soft tissue. And you can shorten the humerus up to two centimeters. So it's a great uh, point to, uh, to remember. Then resection of the tip of the coin process is necessary to avoid impeachment with the anterior flange and limited flexion. Too deep insertion of the ulna component is another potential cause of anterior impeachment. And similarly, resection of the tip of the olecranon avoid impeachment in extension and limited extension. In case or uh, stiff elbow preoperatively, the elbow can be placed in an anterior spleen postoperatively. Usually, I don't ask for a physical therapist, uh, those that do not participate in the rehabilitation process. Uh, I, in this very specific uh, case, I, uh, I propose a static adjustable splinting uh, program uh, in case of um, very stiff elbow preoperatively. Uh, prophylaxis for arteriotopic ossification can be discussed in case of post-traumatic arthritis or of fused elbow with uh, some kind of uh, anti-inflammatory uh, drugs like endometacin or selecoxib. Uh, I, I have no experience with uh, radiation, but uh, you can propose also to prevent a show uh, single beam uh, radiation of uh, 700 uh, zero grade. Um, uh, examination under uh, anesthesia for uh, perioperative albotisness is another adjuvant to postoperative management in this context after usually one month postoperatively. However, despite of uh, this, uh, these different tips, uh, total elbow arthroplasty for cyst elbow does not always allow to obtain a functional range of motion. Uh, in this series I've made with uh, Dr. Moray, uh, reviewing 14 elbows almost fused preoperatively, you see the postoperative range of motion reach only 67 degrees. Uh, we emphasize in this uh, series the development of ectopic bone around the joint, uh, which was observed to adversely affect outcomes. So it is uh, one of the main problem after this, uh, uh, this uh, in this indication. We also recorded seven complications uh, in five of the 14 patients. Here's this case of uh, uh, this patient with a devastating injury, demonstrate angular deformity and one bone for harm. Uh, so with very poor motion and uh, Dr. Mora has performed this prosthesis and eight years after implantation, you can see uh, this, um, this uh, quite functional uh, range of motion for the patient, but with a range of motion of less than 100 degrees. 
This is another case of a post-operative radiograph showing ankylosis of the elbow at 90 degrees in a patient with severe post-traumatic arthritis. And you see this radiograph five years uh, post-operatively showing uh, a good positioning of the of the stem of the components and uh, an excellent result with a functional range of motion of uh, 100 degrees. In literature, stiffness of total elbow arthroplasty is not always reported. It seems uh, that is not a common complication that can be related in this study to arthrofibrosis, heterotopic ossification, or reflex sympathetic dystrophy. Manipulation under anesthesia has been proposed in four cases uh, to deal with the stiffness. A resection of uh, heterotopic uh, ossification has been done in two and a capsule release in one. In this other study, stiffness was reported mostly after unlinked implant compared to semi-linked implant of osseo origin and or fib fib fibrous origin. However, we do not know from this study what has been proposed to the patient to deal with this loss of motion. When the elbow uh, looks stiff postoperatively, I try to, pro to propose a splint program uh, during three months postoperatively. If after one month the patient lost some degree of motion, we can discuss manipulation under anesthesia. You can see this patient without splint, uh, just uh, um, uh, two weeks after surgery. And when I put the spleen, you can see that she can uh, recover some uh, almost full extension. So we discussed already of uh, uh, heterotopic ossification uh, postoperatively. Um, uh, you can see that uh, after total osteoplasty uh, with um, reduced range of motion, uh, re revision can be proposed. However, revision surgery is rarely performed. Usually the patient declines any further surgery. Risk and benefit of a new surgery must always be discussed with this patient. Here we can say we have a, a, a quite uh, prominent anterior ossification. However, this uh, patient had quite good functional motion and uh, no revision surgery was, has been proposed. Another case of uh, tetrotopic ossification postoperatively, despite irradiation, and the patient declined for the surgery despite loss of motion. So this can has to be discussed with the patient. This patient, after revision of a previous total arthroplasty, had a uh, issue at the proximal radio ulnar joint with a painful impingement in pronation supination, and I've perform in these cases a resection of the ossification through a lateral incision and an anchor center position was made and the impeach one of the cases that can uh, necessitate a revision. This patient had difficulty to move her elbows and uh, the x-ray evaluation was performed and show, as you can see, a, quite a malposition of the humeral component. So in this case, I had to, to do a revision to uh, put humeral component in the good position and gain uh, a functional range of motion. Another case of malposition, this, this case in the, of the ulnar component, uh, you see it's not always uh, easy to, uh, to put a ulnar component. Um, so a revision was made and the ulnar component was positioned in the medullary canal. It was not an easy revision because the medullary canal was full of cement and in this case, I, I perform a, a ulnar osteotomy to, uh, to remove the, all the cement. Uh, last case, this patient had a chronic dislocation of the elbows that had been treated with total arthroplasty with a too proud ulnar component positioning because the olecranon was quite dystrophic. Uh, this gave a poor flexion arc, however, no revision was performed uh, in this patient and it is now uh, seven, uh, 19 years follow-up. So it's again case by case uh, to discuss with the patient. Triceps insufficiency is not really a cause of elbow stiffness of total arthroplasty, but it can limit motion. The patient can flex his elbow or extend it by gravity like on this uh, photography of this patient. However, he or she cannot extend his elbow against gravity, for example, cannot reach his head 
with its end or reach a uh, eye, um, eye shelf. So after discussion of the patient of the importance of the impairment and the risk and benefit of a surgery, then assessment of tissue quality uh, is mandatory by means of uh, ultrasound or, uh, or maybe MRI. And if the tissue seems of good quality and not retract, then you can propose if there is a great impairment uh, uh, by the patient, uh, you can propose a direct repair with anchor and suture through bone uh, of the triceps. However, if the triceps tend and look degenerative or poor quality or retract, then you can propose an anchorless rotation flap, uh, especially for a focal defect on the olecranol or a triceps reconstruction can be proposed with a tendon allograft like a semitendinous or an allograft and, and like an echelous tendon like Joachim uh, proposed in his, uh, in his area. So to conclude, I think uh, um, when you have a stiff elbow after total elbow plus, you need first to evaluate the, tip, the type sorry, and severity of the stiffness related to the functional arc of motion and the type of range of motion involved. You need to discuss with the patient is or her specific demand and expectation. Then you have to look to the etiology not related to the implant like uh, ACO or periarticular contractor or triceps insufficiency or related to the implant like malposition. Then you need to discuss with the patient the risk and benefits of revision surgery. In my experience, or uh, more than 200 uh, total blood supply implant, I can remember only maybe three cases that has been revised specifically for stiffness of the total blood supply. So always remember that complication of the total blood supply can be high and can be difficult to manage. So a stiff, a pain-free elbow can be sometimes preferable to an infected elbow or resection of plasty. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre, for this uh, talk. Uh, on the chat, we have uh, two different questions, which is very interesting. The first one is uh, how to manage a ligament repair to have a stable but uh, not a stiff elbow. This is the first question. And I think uh, it's important to detail uh, the uh, protocol, the postoperative protocol uh, when uh, you have a stiff elbow. Uh, perhaps, uh, Pierre, you can uh, explain uh, your experience uh, with spleen, with rehabilitation. What is your protocol if uh, the elbow is stiff? If the elbow is stiff preoperatively and uh, I have problem uh, to gain uh, full of motion during surgery, I prescribe to, to, to the patient, I propose to the patient uh, the, uh, an adjustable uh, splint uh, in extension and sometimes in flexion uh, during almost uh, three months to uh, uh, preserve the gain of motion I obtained during surgery. Usually no uh, therapy or, or no uh, specific exercise, just a static spleen. Okay, and uh, uh, is there uh, uh, an interest to have uh, manipulation under anesthesia? Uh, this has been proposed. I'm quite uh, a little scared to do a manipulation under anesthesia. I try not to do, uh, so I prefer uh, to let the uh, splint for uh, for weeks than to do a manipulation under anesthesia. Usually the, the elbow is very thin, very fragile, especially in rheumatoid arthritis or, or juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. And I try not to, uh, to, 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 to force on the elbow. Okay, thank you. Pierre and Graham have a question. How do you manage uh, the ligament to have a stable but not a stiff elbow after surgery? It's for Graham or for me? Oh, for you and for Graham. Uh, I don't understand this question because when I do, uh, I do mainly a semi-constrained arthroplasty, so I, I do not repair the, the, the ligament. I just uh, release the ligament from the humerus and that's it. So that's not a problem for me. Uh, for me, of course, uh, I do repair the ligaments when I'm doing a linked or unlinked arthroplasty uh, because I think it may be important in the long term for, for wear and stability. 
but we don't know that for sure. Certainly for an unlinked arthroplasty, I always repair the ligaments. And a younger, higher demand patient, I'm having to do a linked arthroplasty, then I actually do repair the ligaments. But it's important to repair them isometrically at the axis of motion. Uh, that's the key to avoid stiffness when you're repairing the ligaments. And you need to move the elbow, of course. Uh, perhaps we, we will move to the last communication with uh, Joachim and after we will have time to, to discuss uh, uh, a little bit after. So Joachim, I'm very happy that uh, you are here with us. Uh. Well, thank you very much for the uh, invitation to participate in this wonderful uh, webinar. My task is to discuss a few uh, items about um, revision elbow arthroplasty in general, not just for stiffness, but uh, overall. So something that I think is important in these cases when you start to prepare your case in surgery is to make sure about understanding the skin incision. Oftentimes, these patients had prior trauma or, of course, another elbow arthroplasty before. So there may be multiple skin incisions and make sure that you select the one that you think is going to be best for soft tissue healing. I really think it's important to prevent infection. We know that in elbow arthroplasty that is critical. So I have moved to using a steel tunicate in every single case, not only because it's um, safer in terms of your proximal uh, surgical field preparation, but also because if you have to go more proximally and uh, find the radial nerve or do a more extensive approach to the humerus, then it's easy to remove when you're done with your dissection. We already talked about the importance of preventing any injury to the ulnar nerve, so my first move is always to identify the ulnar nerve. I typically use a cellular retractor between the medial triceps and the medial skin flap, and once the nerve is identified, it is carefully isolated uh, typically with a vessel loop. My preference, if a patient has an already transposed ulnar nerve and uh, the patient has no symptoms of ulnar neuropathy before surgery, is to identify the um, nerve and then protect it very carefully through the case, but not do a complete dissection. But I think it's mandatory to know what it is. And if you go proximal enough on the medial side, it is almost always possible to identify the nerve. Then we will move for with our exposure distally. And something we have talked about at length is the benefit in primary arthroplasty of keeping your triceps on. I think that's also more the case in revision arthroplasty for two reasons. If the patient already had the triceps detached once and it healed, I think it's very risky to detach it a second time because it may not heal the second time around. But more importantly, in many of these patients with failed elbow arthroplasties, they're going to have some bone loss on the humeral side and the presence of bone loss is going to facilitate tremendously being able to uh, dislocate the joint with the triceps on. In every revision, I will take a sample of tissue that is sent to fat pathology. I know that there is some controversy about the value of pathology, but I always send one sample to see if there is evidence of acute inflammation. And if there is, I will actually back off and not complete the revision. And then I always take five samples of tissue. And for each sample, I use a different instrument, so a different point and a different knife blade so that they are not already touching the tissue by the time I take the next sample. Uh, sometimes I will take them from the joint space only, but most of the times I take a few from the joint space and then a few from the canal. Then you want to identify any mechanisms that contribute to failure. In this case, one of them was backing out of this screw that is used for linking of this particular prosthesis, uh, because you want to prevent anything that already failed in the past. And then you continue with your exposure by detaching the tissues of the medial column. Um, for many revision cases, if there is substantial bone loss, you can actually do the whole exposure, even in a stiff elbows, with a lateral parallel approach. But uh, in many of the cases that um, have adequate uh, tissue distally, you may be able to work through two different windows, one medial and one lateral. In the revision setting, sometimes it is difficult to know where exactly is the interval laterally. So something that you can use in your benefit is you use a periosteal elevator that you will move across the joint to find where is the lateral aspect of the triceps and then follow that in the triceps unconscious interval to create a limited window or uh, you can choose to do just the whole exposure as Dr. Graham King has described with a lateral paralegal uh, approach. Then you're going to dislocate the joint and that requires releasing a lot of uh, tissue oftentimes from uh, both parts of the uh, elbow joint, both medially and laterally. Uh, and oftentimes in a stiff elbows, this is extremely important. So we will end up in order to maintain the extensor mechanism intact, essentially enucleating the uh, distal humerus by releasing all that tissue. Remember that 
at this type of the dissection, it is extremely important to keep thinking about the location of the ulnar nerve because it may be very easy to damage it if you don't know where it is. Once the elbow is dislocated, then if the implant is grossly loose, it will be easy to remove. But if the implant is well fixed, you have to think about techniques that are going to allow you to remove the implant without uh, major uh, bone loss. So in this case, the uh, implant was debonded at the cement bone interface. So when that happens, we all get super happy in the operating room because there's no more suffering. Uh, but uh, then you can take extra uh, cultures uh, from the canal uh, and then uh, you can proceed with uh, your reconstruction. And in many situations where there is adequate um, bone, it will be possible uh, to just cement implants in the canal and that's your simple revision. But in other cases, you have to uh, rely on more complex reconstructions. Uh, when you're going to do a cemented revision, it's important to make sure that the canal is really clean. So I like to use a uterine curette that will really remove all the membrane. Sometimes we underestimate how much uh, there is. And uh, then you have to think about the reconstructive options. And you can use a cemented standard component, but sometimes you have to use other uh, techniques. The challenge is when you have to remove well-fixed uh, ulnar components. Uh, so in this case, this patient had a substantial uh, skin loss and tricep loss. Uh, you can see how the implant is easily uh, disarticulated, but unfortunately, both components were well fixed. So we're using an extractor to see if it's possible to remove the component. And when that is not possible, a tool that I really like to use is a pencil tip burr that we're going to be working around the components so that we can free up uh, completely the cement implant bone interface. And if that doesn't work, then you have to move on to doing an osteotomy uh, or a window. The same thing can be used on the humeral side. So we're using a pencil tip bird to really minimize how much bone and how much cement is uh, lost uh, at the time of component removal. And then once you create that uh, space uh, on the lower part of the component, then it's typically possible to remove it. However, in some situations, you have to be more invasive and start with a corticotomy and then move to a window if necessary to remove uh, these components. And as you plan your window, make sure that you make it long enough and narrow enough. On the ulna, if you're preserving the triceps, you may want to consider an extended or like an osteotomy. In this case, we're going to expose an infected elbow with a well-fixed component by removing all the cement and the bone. And of course, you have to be prepared to then wire that uh, in place. And then sometimes, if you have a patient with an infection, the only way to ensure that we're not removing all the cement is to use arthroscopic instruments that can be placed in the canal. In terms of bone reconstruction, one option is to use impaction grafting. Impaction grafting is ideal for expanded capillary defects. So if most of the envelope of the elbow is preserved, but you have a large capillary defect, we have noticed uh, in our practice that if you just cement a component with a really thick cement mantle, then most likely that is not going to work. So one option that uh, is stolen from the hip literature by Robin Ling about impaction grafting is to place an instrument in the canal that will uh, still keep a space for your cement column and uh, for your implant and then pack a bone graft very, very tightly. And here the key is to have a small pieces of uh, bone that are packed really tightly, so tight that when you remove that uh, instrument that you can see in the canal, you will have a completely newly formed canal. And uh, interestingly, Cement interdigitation in these patients is incredibly effective. And once you have the bone compacted on the lateral aspect of the cortex and then anteriorly and posteriorly, it's possible to get a very adequate cementing technique inside that neo canal that was formed in the operating room with cancellous allograft. For more extensive uh, defects that still don't require to replace the whole circumference of the elbow, one can use a strut augmentation, which is something that has worked particularly well when you have a patient that requires revision in the setting of a periprosthetic fracture. So this is a structure that is applied, in this case, in the only in this animation, and allows reconstruction of uh, the uh, bone stock and augmentation for future revision. But in patients that have more extensive defects, an allograft prosthetic composite may be necessary. The original experience that was already reported by Dr. Mansat wasn't very successful with almost a 50% failure rate, but we have modified the technique and by using now plate compression, that will provide you the ability to heal at the junction and will provide also rotational stability. And one thing that has become very useful in my complex revision arthroplastic practice is to actually use a proximal ulna that comes with triceps 
because the challenge in these patients is that oftentimes when you lose the olecanone, you also lost the attachment of the triceps. So if you order a graft with a triceps, then you can do reconstruction. And then if you keep the elbow mobilized for about six weeks, it is possible, like in this case, to not only restore bone stock, but also a strength and its extension. So this patient, as you can see, required an APC both on the ulna and the humerus. And on the ulna side, we used an allograft with triceps. And then connection of the triceps of the allograft to the triceps of the patient allows active extension. And you can see how even in this elderly patient that had a triceps disconnected for the longest time, he was able to do adequate extension against resistance. And that is thanks to the healing of the muscle fibers to the tendon, which I don't think is the same when you try to do a repair of a tendon allograft to a uh, bone allograft, as you could do with an Achilles allograft, for example. So in a nutshell, this is a uh, short review of uh, how things can get really complicated. And the last thing that I want to mention is that very rarely one can resort to using what we would call two more prosthesis or more cemental replacement. This patient had a prior APC that failed, and you can see how with a custom prosthesis it's possible to get these patients a better. So in summary, remember the importance of pre-op planning, avoid injury to the ulnar nerve, always respect the traffic, be careful with component and cement removal, and you may need to use some techniques like impaction grafting, a start augmentation, an APC, and occasionally a tumor prosthesis. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Joachim. Um, is there any questions? When I, I, I saw your presentation, I think uh, the best treatment for stiffness is uh, prevention. <laughs> no question. <laughs> it's so spectacular when you have to extract all the components and uh, grafting. Uh, it's so easy uh, at the hip. But uh, for the elbow, the, the bone is very little, so it's, uh, you feel dangerous like this. <laughs> I agree. Yes, Graham. Well, thank you, Joaquin, for just a masterful talk. I just wanted to ask you, uh, for your APCs, how do you actually get the fixation of the screws around the, the stems or using unicortical screws or circlage wires? What's your, what's your tricks? Yeah, so that's a very good question, Graham. So on the humeral side, um, I use a 3.5 millimeter plate. So it's not a large fragment, it's a small fragment plate. And the benefit of that is that it's narrower, so you can move the plate either very lateral or very medial. And I seldom use locking screws because the locking screw will give you a guided trajectory. So if you angle the drill, sometimes you will scratch the implant and the cement mantle to some extent, but it's possible oftentimes to get the screws uh, on one side of the stem. Um, and if I'm going to bypass the junction, which is most commonly what I do, oftentimes I will actually place my plate with a trial so that I know that my screws will not be in the way of my real implant, then remove the trial and then cement. And of course, the risk of that is that sometimes cement will come out through the holes. Alternatively, you can do cementing first and then plating but then you cannot get as much compression because the cement already is kind of impeding any migration at the junction. And then on the ulnar side is essentially the same, depending on what implant you use is different. With the Kunrad more is actually easier because it's such a, uh, it's higher on the canal of the ulnar, so you can easily place the screws behind with the latitude, which is my implant of choice. It's a little bit more tight, but you can still make it happen. I think people get in trouble when they tell you use a large fragment plate on the humeral side, which is classic teaching from the AO. But the other thing with a large fragment plate is that the screws are more spread apart. You don't get as many holes in your segment. So I don't know if that answers your question, Graham. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, so we are just in time. Um, thank you all. Uh, of the speaker for accepting for this uh, to participate to this webinar. It was a great pleasure to to meet you, uh, even if it's uh, on the web. Uh, now it's time to wrap up. I, I hope you enjoyed the webinar. The next webinars will be held in French in June, September, and October uh, for more general topics on shoulder pain wrist sprains and uh, sub pain and the next uh, specialized webinar in english will take place at the end of uh, uh, november uh, for surgical treatment of the uh, 
a spastic upper limb. Uh, it would be uh, moderated uh, by Karen Leclerc. So thank you all. Have a good evening and uh, see you very soon. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye bye. Au revoir. Bientôt. Au revoir. Au revoir, Dominique. Merci à tous. Merci à tous. À très bientôt.